We're back for another week of defense with D.C. Dan Carroll. And this week, we're going to focus on one game in particular, Texas-Alabama, to see what we can learn from that. So, Dan, it's great to have you back for another week, another great weekend of football. And as you pointed out, a lot of takeaways from uh, this particular game, Texas versus Alabama. Yeah, you could build a whole teach tape off of some of the things you see in that game. Both defenses played really well, played great situational defense. Uh, The mistakes they made, things you can learn from, things they end up cleaning up later in the game as well. So great job by their staffs to to make those adjustments as, as the game went on. I know one of the things you saw early, something that did need to get adjusted, was a long run by Alabama in which you didn't get a crack replace. Yeah, so... What happened in the play, they motion the slot back to the boundary, and then they run the outside zone to the field. And the nickel edges up the tight end, and the, the receiver cracks to the safety, and the corner replaces hard and aggressive, but he doesn't replace inside the force player. So they end up with two guys outside. Really unfortunate just because I thought it wasn't a bad call. Nobody was really particularly wrong from Texas standpoint. But when you give the players that Alabama has just that much daylight, that guy's going to burst through the hole and go. So, you know, that corner from Texas, he needed to replace inside the nickel. So I kind of talked to you about it. A drill that I think is extremely important because you can't play great run defense just relying on your D-line and linebackers. I know that that's the, you know, the two inside guys for your, for your defensive line are typically going to decide whether you have a good run defense or not. But, you know, when those balls do squirt, which they tend to do, they will find the, you know, some of the runs are going to find some daylight and get out. It's, it's got to be the secondary that keeps them going for eight and nine instead of 27 and 36, you know? So I think that's, it's important that the secondary really understands their place in the run game. And it's not as simple as saying, well, when we rotate you down and cover three and you're the A-gap player, you got to get in there and and hit the back. Like, yeah, that's pretty simple. It's the rotations in the back end based on where the ball is going that becomes what is really important to get the ball on the ground. So we used to have a drill we called the swarm drill. And you can make it as elaborate as you want it to. I mean, we would have the nickel there and and the safeties in the corners and sometimes the wheel linebacker, just depending on if you're getting a lot of slot to the boundary, like two by two slot to the boundary type thing, however you want it and however many people need to be there. But, you know, you run an outside zone, maybe to the field, and then you get your rotations. And like I said on here before, I I look at the secondary in run game and pass game. And I, it makes sense to me to think of it just kind of how a baseball team rotates when the ball's hit, like if the ball's hit over there, we all got to go here. So they get the perimeter to the field corner protects the sideline, free safety runs the alley, backside safety replaces the field side safety, finds the angle, and then your corner becomes your hawk. So that's simple if the ball's just run out there. But now work that drill, and however you teach those guys, work that drill off every single crack situation. You know, just like that one right there, the situation we're talking about, the safety should become the – heat. Or the nickel sets the edge. He, now he's the guy protecting the sideline off the crack. The corner has to fill inside. The in, onside safety has got to stay in the crack. You always have to crack the crack. You cannot uh, work outside of the crack block because somebody's expecting you to stay in there. And then the backside safety has got to look to replace the frontside safety. And then the corner, backside corner has to become the hawk in case the ball pops and got to take an angle to get it down. So, you know, it's somewhat of a pursuit drill, but it's really about finding where you fit off of these certain runs and when the ball hits the perimeter. And then in one high, you know, you practice it the way we did it corner protects the sideline and becomes a late fill if the nickel gets it forced. So as you protect in the sideline, if you feel the ball hit inside the nickel, you fall back inside. You're a late fill player. And then the post player runs the alley and the backside corner replaces the post player and then finds the angle to the ball. And then it is the backside force player, curl flat player who becomes the Hawk, which, you know, that's something that can be done either way, either with the backside corner or the backside curl flat player in, in, they we're just talking cover three for now but because for a couple of reasons you know your backside curl flat player might be a an outside linebacker if that's the case and it's maybe not what you want to do and then the other thing is like sometimes you lose the hawk in that situation because if they 
leave somebody back there, he's going to stay back there, right? If the uh, you know receiver ran a bubble back there or something, he's not going to. It's going to be so late for him to get out. So you know, you can use it as the backside curl flat player or the backside corner. But you know, I think that's a staple drill for us. Like that is something that's every you know at least once a week. You know, every day maybe in spring ball for at least five minutes, and then at least once a week during the season is just. How do we rotate if the ball goes here? How do we rotate the back end? If the ball goes here, how do we rotate the back end? Because you have to be in position to get the ball on the ground. I think the most important thing is really replacing whoever's running the alley. So when you have the, the field side safety run the alley in quarters and say you're just, you know, in palms and they crack the nick, he's got a goal, like the backside safety coming over to kind of place his depth and his leverage and find the angle to the ball from that point, that's the guy that ends up being the you know the guy that keeps the ball from from busting for 30 right he's the guy so i think coaching that is is good and it just it's important it's not a full pursuit drill but it's important i think to get those rotations down and, and really understand when the ball hits the perimeter gets outside and then off all the crack scenarios like where do we got to fit i really like this drill in in the setup and the way you can adjust it week to week and as you said it Kind of like a pursuit drill, but not. And I, I've always thought of pursuit drills. Number one, I think they're done in, in such a general way. And, and maybe early in camp or spring ball or whatever, if you're looking to reinforce that idea of, hey, we got to run to the ball, then it has a purpose. But it, it starts to lose its purpose. You just start running around. And, and how many times do you really want you know your backside end have to track a guy down, you know, 40 yards down the field. Um, you don't want those situations. And I, I think this is very productive in getting guys to move and understand, you know, where they need to be when you make these certain calls. Instead of hanging out on their part of the field, there's there's movement, there's the rotations and everything. And, and like you said, you can make this very specific to what you're going to see in any particular week. And I think that's where drills gain their value when they can do those kinds of things and fit uh, a purpose but then be adjusted to handle certain situations handle certain looks etc and you really have a good drill then yeah you know it's, it's when you bring something up about just running there because and then talking about the defensive end because i started to think about this and kind of build this out as a younger coach when i realized you know we would coach every defense to have a chase player. If the full flow goes away from you, you, you run through the backfield and chase the ball deep as the deepest, right? You become the, the cutback boot reverse type guy, right? right? If you're the edge player and the ball full flow away, they just run sweep away from you. And you should chase that thing deep as the deepest because the, you know, you're in position to do that. So I, I thought about that and we try to build that into every defense. And then we go out there day one of fall camp and what do we tell that DN to do in the pursuit drill? Right. Haul, haul, haul down the field, you know, on an angle. I'm like, well, we're actually not coaching that guy to do that, right? We're coaching to do this. So I was like, man, we could be so much more deliberate with pursuit, right? We don't have to be set up 11 cones on the sideline and just watch guys go to track practice. So how do we get more deliberate with our pursuit drill and, and where guys are going to fit versus the – the blocker or the receiver that they got to cover, just whatever within your scheme, being more deliberate with a pursuit drill. And I would say that's what our swarm drill kind of was. It was a secondary pursuit drill that was very deliberate based on blocking schemes that we're going to see from a crack perspective or just, you know, from a tight ends blocking nickels and where we got to fit off that. I think the other point to make there too is you have a very specific behavior you want out of that end in, in that situation right being able to pursue as you said as the deepest back and looking for you know, reverse uh, counter and around boot whatever it might be you got to have eyes on that in practice right we tend to focus on the front side of things and sometimes move our eyes and, and forget to look at the back side of things but always be checking up on that it's very important to reinforce it because if you know you'll have that guy just ball goes away take the playoff a little bit he's got a job a very important job because if he messes up if he gets lazy his eyes aren't where he's supposed to be he's pursuing in, you know at the wrong depth etc yeah. now you got a big play and continuing to look at this game i know you saw something you like to call 40s coverage which is essentially quarters and zero together talk about what you saw in the game here 
Yeah, so Texas was bringing fire in the corner a lot. I think one time they actually traded it to the free safety, but they were utilizing versus a lot of three-by-ones. And sometimes you double call it. It's a fire zone concept. And then if it's three-by-one or, you know, whether true three-by-one or any version of where number two receiver to the boundaries in the back, you might go to what, what I call 40 coverage. And you can run it with any fire zone concept. I've certainly ran it with every fire zone blitz pattern that, that we have. But they were specifically running it with corner fire or free safety fire, which is just playing quarters to the field and playing zero to the boundary. So you were able to get – they were getting to their, like, mini concept to the field, and they were able to get that safety over there and then just play zero coverage to the boundary, which when they started playing a lot more quarters, they were one high. Texas was one high most of the first quarter, and then it kind of in the second quarter it started to started to change a little bit. It, it becomes a great disguise, uh, especially with, you know, the college hashes. And I say this now after having been through the pro hash world, but – to be able to blitz the corner off the college passes is such a, a uh, such a benefit. I mean, I think everybody should be blitzing the boundary corner off those hashes just because he has such a good angle for running in the pass. And even if, I mean, you recall the the one that the guy missed and the Alabama quarterback made an unbelievable play. But if you if you go back to that play, he actually took a great line to the quarterback. I mean, he was exactly where you wanted him to be. The guy just beat him, you know. So I just think that blitzing the corner is great. So. They're able to utilize 40 coverage where they can play quarters to the field and zero to the boundary, and it gives you a lot of things. For one, the way to get to it, if you think about it, is just take the post safety in your fire zone world. You know, whatever fire zone blitz you have, just take the post safety and then just move them to the field over top of the nearest eligible. So if there's two over there, you know, maybe you go over there and play palms. You just stick him over there. If there's three over there, then, you know, you probably got to play some mini concept, and he's over three. So – you know, you can do that, and then you zero up the backside. So the thing I like about it is sometimes in fire zone coverage, they max you up or they get six men in there to protect. They they pick it up, and now you're in fire zone coverage, and the quarterback's still back there, you know, patting the ball. So what you can do, though, because you have a zero side and the will linebacker is essentially in zero coverage, if it's basic distribution, you get an ad. Right, and you saw Texas actually got one. The guy probably added a split second late. I think the coaches would probably tell you, you added a split second late, and it was the one that, you know, later in the game, probably in the third quarter, that Alabama completed like the dig route on the back side of it, and they got it for a first down. But he got hit. I mean, they really hit the quarterback. They hit Bryce Young really hard, and it was because the will was able to add because the back protected back side on the zero side. As soon as he blocked the will, added, smoked him. If he would have done it. And if you watch the play, probably could have done it a split second earlier and he might have got the sack off of it. Might have, might have actually changed the game a little bit. So, you know, I think that it's a great concept if you're a fire zone team and maybe you're only comfortable doing it in three-by-ones. A lot of people do that because they don't want to have, you know, the will linebacker uh, out on a number two receiver, which is understandable. Uh, I think there's – just depends on what you're going to do. Maybe you can, you know, depends on where you're rotating and where you're blitzing from. But it's a great change up, especially the three-by-one. So if you want to double call that fire zone to 40 coverage with it versus three by one is really good. The other thing is, you know, how do you, do you get back to it? Like I said, if it's two, if there's a slot over there, maybe you get back to your regular fire zone and I will typically get back to it if it's empty, you know, even in, in my world, I'll play it versus that slot out there. But if it's empty, I would always get back to regular, you know, three deep three under fire zone just because we're not going to play zero with nobody over the top or potential of nobody over the top with the will linebacker. So it's a staple to me if you run fire zones to be able to get into 40 coverage. I know the one thing you like about this and just to emphasize the point is that you can add the blitzers versus max pro, right? Uh, one answer for a lot of teams is to, you know, get into a seven-man pro, take a play-action shot, try to isolate somebody. And the idea is not necessarily that you have to pick up seven, is that you're going to get a lot of help on the guys who are there. So, you know, you now start to add more people, take away the help, which decreases the amount of time for the quarterback to sit there and throw the ball down the field. Yeah, I mean, you get into the fire zone world, and so often you see seven guys, blocking five guys rushing and a couple underneath guys that are just standing there and they're matching their coverage from a width standpoint because that you're going to tell those guys to drop over their coverage but you know they're working two-man combinations on the back side or on the front side and they're not getting enough depth out of your underneath coverage 
and the quarterback has plenty of time to, to wait for those to develop because they got seven guys blocking five. So the thing I like about 40 is we used to see a lot when you would fire the boundary, fire the corner, you know, the back or the tight end, it would be like a, they would cross protect, the, the back would come back and, and cut the edge on the backside or the tight end might start in like a yo position to the field and come back and cut the edge. And it gave our will linebacker, in this case, if you're running – you know, if you're running the corner fire, we'll just stick with that because that's what Texas did. But the Will linebacker a chance to add right in the crease in the C gap. And, you know, we were able to get sacks off of it at times. Just, you know, an answer to having guys sitting back there in max protection where you can add them. And some people do that in regular fire zone. It's not as common. I know at one time Alabama was doing that. That was years ago, maybe 10 years ago. I studied them and they were kind of doing that. So maybe that's more common than I realized. But I've never been a part of doing that if, if your coverage blocks and true 3d three under we kind of drop over to coverage and wait for them to leak out so this was a way that we could get those ads and get you know six guys coming or whatever to to make the quarterback get the ball out and, you know the one thing like i said that the weakness is obviously the backside x he has a lot of time and distance because Texas did a good job holding holding the disguise so you're telling that safety he's in zero coverage and he's 10 by two off the off the x receiver and he's got him in zero coverage and uh, Alabama never came back to that side until, like I said, the one example later in the game, maybe might have been the beginning of the fourth, maybe the end of the third, somewhere in there that they threw that dig for a big first down. It's a tough position for the safety, it really is. So if they're going to come back to that, then there there might be some things that you want to do. But if, if they're going to come back and work the X, X receiver, then it is a uh, safety got to be able to cover them and stuff. But you got to add and you got to get home. In a lot of the situations, seven-man pro, you know, you're, you're teaching the quarterback your touchdown to check down, and you know, the check down usually comes by a guy who is assigned seven-man protection and is able to leak out because seven guys don't come. So, you know, again, it's just matching those numbers, putting that pressure on them, and really decreasing that amount of time. You don't want that guy sitting back there forever and being able to pick you apart. So kind of maintaining that same kind of uh, timing that he has to get the ball off. And I think that's a sound way to approach it. In in regard to maintaining rush lanes, something we talked about last week, one area you saw coming up was six-man pressure and peel. And in that situation, the point you made to me is, you got to make sure you still have somebody in that leverage position, something we talked about last week. Yeah, I thought Texas had some really timely blitzes. They brought six guys, played man. I'm a big fan of bringing six and eating the back with those six, still having a guy in the post. Not too high in the bring six, play straight zero, and have sign somebody to the back and leave the middle of the field wide open. So I, I like what they did. I like the plan. What can happen is the back either he leaks out or runs angle routes, which that is the most difficult one, and that's where it is. It can be hard when he runs the angle route. And when they swing, a defensive end can typically do a decent job covering a swing, at least in my experience. That's not very difficult for them guys. But when they push you flat and come back in and run like the angle routes and get over the ball, I mean, you saw it happen in the two-minute drive where the, the Alabama got the one play they really hit on them that took him across midfield was to the back and it was off appeal and the defense was trying to cover this guy on like a little, almost like a vertical out of the backfield. You'd call it an angle route if you want, but it was kind of like a quick seam out of the backfield, difficult route to cover. So it, but the point was, and it happened a few times in the game, you have off the ball blitzers to create your six man pressures. If you're going to peel, you really want to try to get one of those guys to add to be the leverage rush because you still have to have the leverage of the pocket. And I thought for the most part of the game, Texas did a pretty good job. There were a few breakdowns in the edges. You know, they ran a Tex game out of Bear one time with the, the three technique being one of the backers, and he just didn't have the ability, the juice to get outside. And that's when um, – actually, luckily for them, the, it was a, it became a penalty. I think it was like a block – downfield block. But it was the one where the quarterback – scrambled out he broke the pocket and he scrambled out and got it it was like third and four somewhere near midfield and then it was like I think it was the one where they had like the blindside block or the blocking back toward the player or whatever and it took him back it didn't count but you know they used the three technique to run like the text game with the end they used the backers three technique and it just he didn't have the the, the the weight and strength to work through those blocks to get outside and, and leverage the pocket so that was maybe one breakdown I noticed but they did a pretty good job of pushing the middle I thought 
of collapsing the, the depth of the pocket. They got their edges. They, they got width to the pocket a lot, but they, they did a great job. I thought collapsing depth. You saw Bryce Young tuck it, you know, sometimes and just kind of know where to go. And that's really what you want to see. But getting back to the, the peel part, when you have off the ball guys blitzing, a lot of times you're blitzing at the back anyway. If they see him go, they need to try to replace the leverage rush part of it because what happens so often is when you start peeling those guys and the offensive line understands that's what you're going to do, the tackle will kick see you leave and then he'll squeeze back to the B gap and block whoever the B gap rusher is. Well, by the time he engages with him, if you're an off the ball backer and you wrap off that tight to, to be the leverage rusher on that side, it's been my experience. A lot of times the tackle won't make it back out to you after he's kicked to the C gap, that guy leaves and he slides back in the B and he engages with the three tech or whoever's brushing the B gap, whether it's a backer or the three technique, then you have a, a lot of times a pretty free wrap to the quarterback. So, yeah, I would just say when, you, when you're running pressures where you're bringing six but leaving a guy in the post, and the, I always say that, um, you know, we used to say, I have a line coach from Louisiana, a great guy, he, he said it's a peel and eat pressure, right? we got to peel the back, and then if he steps up in the middle, we got to eat him, right? So, you know, he, he used a shrimp analogy, but so you got to peel and eat, right? So if you have to in a pressure where you got to peel the back and eat him, eat him on the inside, then you have to get back to leverage rushers with the off-the-ball blitzers. As with anything we do, if it's something you're going to see quite a bit, something you're going to see throughout the season, these situations are going to happen. You have to drill these up. So um, from your perspective, what are some ways you can can drill this and make sure you get those reps necessary? Because it's not always going to, you know, that we're going to cover it in team. You, maybe you only get a couple looks at it in team. So how are you able to drill this up and make sure that, one, you're getting that, that peel the way you want so that guys maybe not, over pursuing and get getting beat back inside on on like that angle route that you mentioned and that you're maintaining that leverage lane yeah this is again like i've talked about in the past this is something that is a great summer work it is great summer work to work on cans and to have the various different ways that a guy can uh leave exit the backfield you know when you when you run these type of pressures i think that you have to have a great plan for exit motion Who's going to take it? Is the peel player going to grab it? Is the backer going to come out of the pressure? Okay, that's if he exits out the backfield. What if he hots out? What I would call hot out, like he starts like his fly motion out of the backfield early and they snap the ball real quick. Who's got that one? Does that become a peel now? Does that become an exit? So those are the things you have to work on when you run you know, six man pressures where you got to, you know, where you have to peel and eat. So it becomes a great summer project to, to get your blitz patterns down on cans with the D-line and the linebackers or the safeties, whoever whoever you're bringing to make six, to get your blitz patterns down and understand how we're going to beat the slide and how we're going to attack it. You know, I thought on one of these, Texas did a really nice job. They ended up four on two, and it was it was pretty good. You know, they ended up four on two, and they got a sack off of it. So, you know, they, they kind of had an understanding on how to cross the blocks and how to beat the slide and, and where they wanted to blitz at. So just working the patterns as much as you can in the summer and making sure that if – you expect the back using the back's alignment for one. A lot of times, it, the, everybody's heard split out to get out, and, and they're going to do that. A lot of times, if they're going to get out, if they're going to scat pro or six, that uh, they're going to might tell you that pre snap. I think communicating it up front. You know, a lot of times defensive ends aren't paying attention to the width of the back as much as maybe linebackers are, and linebackers got to make sure that those guys are going to are going to peel and understand that they're in a situation to peel and, and definitely formational issues if they have a cut x and a split back like a lot of times that's a recipe for get mesh right there off the three by one mesh so that part of, of alerting it pre-snap but just the backers and the off the ball guys that might have to adjust their blitz path key in the back i think is probably what becomes the biggest thing so when you his vision on the back and just seeing his demeanor and as soon as the ball snapped he's out or he's moving he's not moving in the direction to block or he's not moving with blocking demeanor like you got to make adjustments then because if it don't matter how many you bring if if you let the back hot quickly and, and the ball goes to him right now like he's in space it's it's different right it's it's an adjustment now for everybody now we're all in pursuit so you know the backers eyes and whoever the off the ball guy is to that side just got to be able to to see that and make the adjustment and, you know I, I really think it's important that when you have a normal summer schedule a normal spring schedule that you, you find the things that you can get really good at in the off season. You know, what are the, what are the drills? What are the things we can get really good at 
you can get good at this stuff without the coach, right? I teach you the drill. I teach you the blitz path and spring ball maybe. And, and we know what it is. And now like, Hey, these are 10 things or 12 drills or, or skills that we can get really good at in the summer. You wouldn't even need me there as your coach. You guys can get together, you know, after workouts or whatever, when you guys want to do extra and, and work these blitz pass and work these different peel situations. And these are the things that are going to come up in the game. And, you know, we spend so much time on base O and base D, but the, the, the real things that come up in the game that make you win or lose games are things like this. So, I mean, if you just think about that, if I, I know it was, again, extremely difficult, but if Texas would have covered that angle route in two-minute drill, they probably win the game. So it's, it's one of those things, like build out the list of things you can do well in the summer and well without pads and without maybe without a coach being there and, and get, try to get as good as you can at those things. And I think these blitz patterns and that type of thing, and that's what, these are one of them for sure. Great coaching points there. And moving into our, our next teachable aspect of this game, you really liked their safeties and coverage. You liked how active they were and how they got involved in, uh, especially, you know, when we, they were in a situation, what you would call a dead quarter. So you saw really well-coached safeties here. I felt like, yeah, I really did. I thought that, like I was telling you before the show, when I look at safety play, especially in quarters, that's kind of, I base everything out of that for our defense. And we get to a lot of different coverages. Don't get me wrong. We're not, we're not strictly quarters by any stretch, but we have to be able to play quarters to be successful in our scheme and, and play it well. And so our, our free safety, boundary safety that is a, a very skilled and instinctual position because there's very often you end up in like two back situations or a yo tight end that's probably not going to go vertical you end up playing what i call a dead quarter like you mentioned and that's where you don't have a vertical responsibility per se right there's nobody lined up in a vertical position to stretch you down the field so how active and how aggressive can we play you wherever we want to do it i mean we read the stem of the X receiver first to know if we're going to stay backside or front side. And typically if you get an inside stem of the X, that safety is going to grab it. And then the corner is going to push high. If you get an outside stem, now the safety is going to work front side, not the corner. So we're usually reading his stem first. Not always. Like sometimes it's becoming more common that people will run inside stems, of the X receiver, sit them down and still try to run the deep over route. So they're trying to, mess with the rules I think I think that's where that's come from a little bit trying to mess with the rules of those dead quarter safeties so you have to be careful of that but if they played those guys very aggressive to the front side digs I thought it was interesting I've not seen probably very many times you play that aggressive like across the field through the dig window and you know obviously the quarterback extremely experienced one of the best in, in college football so he, he never really put him in a vulnerable position with that but there were some times where I was looking like oh that's wide open oh this guy's sitting on it. So like that ball could have easily went there. I thought in the backside safety could have hit it. So yeah, I was impressed just with how active and aggressive they were. I thought when the ball was going deep, those guys were getting, were climbing. I know one time, I think they were in three deep and they had gotten a condensed split. Bama got condensed splits were in X under and they had a post ball in the back. And then there was actually the corner that shot the middle of the field and they had the vice with the front side safety. So, you know, their rotations, their back end, I thought did a really good job with the rotations and, the, and playing the dead quarter and being aggressive to the front side of the play. You know, and that's one thing that I, I love the dead quarter player. I think that it's uh, it's almost like a high hole player, right? It's a guy that's got to play with vision and instinct. And if you've got a guy that does that, you've got to find more ways to get him in that situation because he can be active on throws that the quarterback doesn't even expect. And one way to do that, I know a lot of people in quarters will, in three-by-ones, will use him as like a poach or use that backside safety on three vertical. And I've gotten almost completely away from that just because it's, I don't want – I want him to be a dead quarter player. I want to create the situation. So, however, we got to play the combinations on the front side to, to play the three receivers with the on the front side with the people on the front side, with the defensive players on the front side. I want to be able to stay over there and do that because it's the same adjustment you have to make if you're going to play half field backside, right? If you're going to play quarter, quarter, half, you have to be able to adjust out to those three receivers, whether you're playing a mini concept or – you know, there's a lot of other ways to do it, I guess, but uh, many seems to be the most common one lately. Really to create situations for that guy to be in a dead quarter and be able to rob, whether you want him to rob digs or whether you want him to close the middle or whether you want to double the X backside. I think the, all those things are valid. 
and, and have a have a place in it. So find an instinctual guy who's good in the run game, has instincts, plays aggressive, can read the quarterback's eyes, and and then create ways for him to to be active and aggressive on the front side of the play because the quarterback's typically not looking ahead of where he throws. I really like how you approach that in that you are looking for those opportunities to allow him to be a playmaker. I just wrote a a little article about it uh, or email about it the other day and something that Jim Knowles talked about, you know, at Ohio State. He talked about it in a clinic when he was at Oklahoma State and the way that they use their Leo player in creating what he says, creating plays for him, playing offense on defense, that kind of concept, right? On offense, we look to get our guys' touches. Well, on defense, you want to create the situations where those guys can really become playmakers, where they can do something that highlights their talents, their abilities. And as you said, you get a good guy doing that, and you mentioned a guy you had at Houston. He's going to do something with those situations that you create for him. Yeah, I mean, you know, I've been able, been fortunate to have some of them, but like, yeah, like we were talking before, the guy uh, at Houston is a guy, Adrian McDonald. He's a coach now. He, he was the most instinctual guy, one of the most instinctual guys I've ever been around. And, you know, athletically, nothing special. You know, he doesn't have any special traits that you would be like, wow. But I, I believe he's still the all time interception leader at the University of Houston, who has a long history of great DBs. I mean, we had, we had three draft pick corners on, on the team he was on, three corners that got, ended up getting drafted actually four that eventually got drafted. And, you know, he was the DB that kind of made it go. And, you know, nothing, again, nothing athletically special, but mentally special, instinctually special. So you get a guy like that. And then this past year in the USFL, I had a guy named Sean Williams, who was actually played at Navy and was a Naval officer at the time, had to get leaves to come play with us. And very similar, very similar type of player and great in the run game, great instinctually off pitting off the quarterback and seeing what was going on and, and being able to rob front side and just, being a player and it really when you get those guys it, it makes a split safety defense go in my opinion well you mentioned you know the guy who's the naval officer which brings to mind the academies which takes us into our option segment here and today the focus is on some two high solutions talk to us about what you see is something that you can do in these situations here to make sure you're putting your guys in the best possible position to be successful yeah, watching Colorado versus Air Force, you know, Colorado State in mostly a too high structure, which can be good. A lot of people utilize that. It's uh, probably spent a good portion of the time I've played against it in that. But I think that one thing that you have to try to focus on is almost counterintuitive when you coach the linebackers because you're going to tell the front side linebacker when he gets the fullback action at him, he's got to get to the alley. So you're almost telling these these linebackers that you know you coach all year and they're slamming their head in the gap and they're playing aggressive and physical. And now when runs coming at you, I, I want you to run away basically. Right. And the backside backer is going to replace you. He's going to be the dive player, but you got to beat the tackle to the alley. As soon as you see the fullback come at you, you got to beat the tackle to the alley. And so w- when you don't do that, you're basically telling the backside safety that he's got to make the tackles, all the tackles on the pitch play. So what happens is, and that's fine, you can get that done. There are a lot of people that are able to do that. But what you have to realize and take a step back and say, the safety has to make the tackle about 35 to 40 yards away from his initial alignment when you think about it. Like he's maybe he's balls on the hash. He's halfway between the hash and numbers to the boundary or he's over the slot to the boundary. And then the ball gets pitched out. And now he's got to make the tackle. I mean, who knows how far, how wide, right? Over by the numbers to the field, maybe. So I think that's something to keep in mind. Like to just say we're going to be able to do that all game, all game, and rely on him to do that it can be difficult at times, I think. That's something from a too high structure, you know. And then you end up getting what I call the horn blocks of the tackle. Like they arc the tackle out, like almost looks like a horn. And everything just gets so wide and runs away from the safety. So that's where, too, if you're getting a lot of horn blocks, one way, and I talk about this a lot, and it's probably going to sound like a broken record by the the season, but you, you want, especially in a 3-4 structure like Colorado's, and you want to be able to switch. They were in some. They, they get to uh, some 2-2 two, two eyes and, and five, five techniques at times, too, but they were in 3-4 a lot. And you want to be able to play some back and forth where the edge guys are forcing the ball. That way you could actually use your inside backer underneath the tackle he can horn and then the inside back can trigger underneath and you don't have to put as much stress on your safety to get so wide because the edge is going to be a lot quicker with the when you're edging up with like the outside linebacker so you know i think that mixing those 
forces up really helps and just not being able to you know, being able to get your mic or your Michael while you're inside linebacker to the alley to not solely rely on the backside safety to make the plays is really important. You know, I will say one thing to understand about playing against Air Force is that they are maybe the most multiple formation option team I've ever seen. And they do such a good job of getting you in different checks and then getting back to their option plays. And, you know, I know one way that I used to look at it before I played them is that, you know, when you play Navy or you play Army, if you get a spread formation, you're probably going to get a spread play. But what Air Force has been able to do is give you somewhat of a spread formation, make you get into a check, but then create the motions that really get them back to their option plays. So they're going to get you in your spread defense and get you and get back to their triple option plays. So you, you have to do a much better job marrying that stuff versus them than maybe you would against the other ones, um, against Army or Navy. So that's one difficult thing. And so if, if you're somebody who is going to play against another team, maybe a high school team or a, a, another college team that, that does that, that is really good tape to get is to get Air Force. So if you're somebody who runs the triple, it's definitely good tape to get. But you know, the two things, too, I would say that you know, I, I've talked a lot about and I always continue to talk about the things you have to do to win against the option. It's the short yardage stops. Right, fourth and ones, fourth and twos. You got to get the loose balls, okay. But the two things you absolutely can't do is you can't let the fullback beat you, and you can't let the ball circle the defense. And when we watched Delaware last week, I thought the two biggest things that they did to win the game, other than the takeaways, was only one time did the ball circle the defense. They lose leverage on the on the pitch, and when the fullback started hurting them, they made some adjustments to get get it stopped. So those were two things that you absolutely have to do is to win. To be in position for short yardage to even matter, you have to do those two things. You have to keep leverage on the ball, cannot let it circle the defense, and you can't let them just jam the fullback at you at will. So if you can do those two things, that's when all the other things start to matter, the short yardage and you know all, all of the all the nuances that, that come with playing the option. And, and I've been on both sides of that, and I know it is not fun when, when you just can't even stop the fullback or the – whatever's happening on the perimeter and you can't get the ball edged up and, and get guys to run to tackle it. So it can be difficult. And the, the last thing I would say about just watching the Colorado air force game is Colorado did a nice job actually up front stemming. They stemmed in and out of three down and four down. But the thing that you have to do there, you have to have a better understanding, I guess, or a really good understanding of what you're going to get. You know, if you, you watch the tape, if you're going to do something that you can't find on tape, like you're going to stem a lot and you can't find anybody that stemmed against them, or you're going to do this, you can't find that, you still have to be able to project what you're going to get. And my experience is when they don't know the front you're going to be in, if you're very multiple, they're going to give you gap schemes and perimeter plays. So what happened is late in the game, they started going to the G lead, and you know, Colorado just really didn't have a, a great answer or never got to getting it edged up or forced the way you would want to. So the G lead play was just – was hurting. I mean, they were getting uh, three-man surface and we're running G lead to it, running G lead, running G lead. And you really – if you're going to get a three-man surface and get that, like a true down tight end, you really want a nine technique to spill the guard. And they had a, a tight end and then the slot was over there as well and they didn't have anybody to outside the slot. They had the guy playing the C gap – excuse me, D gap was off the ball and then they had a, a guy outside the slot. So there was a lot of space in there for the G lead stuff. So as you prepare for it, as you – for plan for to play the option if you don't have the tape of it you still need to be able to work to figure out like okay what are they going to go to if they don't really like this or if we're doing something that's hurting them where are the plays going to go and you know i lived through that as well 2015 when we played navy and we kind of showed them a defense they hadn't seen and, and then they started throwing the ball i mean you, you never this might sound crazy but we gave up by over 250 passing yards and that was such a big win for us because they only rushed for like 100 so you know, what are they going to go to based on what you're doing? And you really have to be able to, to figure that out because you got to practice those things because they're going to have an answer. Right? They're always going to have an answer. And they're, they're going to go to something that they're comfortable with. And if you haven't repped it or you don't know what's coming, there's a good chance they're going to have more success running it than you are stopping it. Well, Coach, I appreciate the detailed coaching points you gave us today. Finding those teachable moments in a big game, Texas versus Alabama, and certainly the option tips that you have here. Uh, as always, I look forward to another week of this. We have another great week of football coming up, and I'm sure you'll be watching and learning as we go. Yeah, I mean, can't wait.